Now, their main rival was this man, Julien David Leroy, who was French, and he had heard about Stuart and Rivette's project and actually scooped them by going to Greece and doing what he thought they were going to do and coming out with this book first. So his book was published four years earlier, and this set off a bitter rivalry and actually contributed to the delay of Stuart and Rebette's publication because they took the time to criticize all of his drawings. But let's look at this. Uh, first of all, this is a Leroy's view of a building out of Thoracos, which some of you may have seen or perhaps will see later in the semester. Uh, it, we now know it's a double-sided stoa, a very interesting building. Uh, but at the time, they assumed it was probably a temple because of the high quality of the stone. And you could see that sailors were able, at the time, to come in quite close. The whole area was silted up since the time that this view was published and probably took away a lot of the superstructure, but in that they were preceded by the Romans who took away quite a few of the columns and brought them into the Athenian Agora in the Augustan period. So we actually have pieces of this building in the Athenian Agora today. The way that Leroy depicts it is showing himself and his friends and some uh, excavators that they hired here. And notice that he's shrunken down the door of capital and there are other, now I'm sounding like James Stewart, but there are other inaccuracies that we could point out here, such as not showing the fluting of the bottommost drum here and various other details, which of course Stewart does point out. But more important than that, look at the overall view that we get, a stormy sky here, the ruin. This is really a depiction of ruins, and that's part of the title of this book. The most beautiful ruins in Greece is what it would translate to in English. So we see it in a romantic view with plants growing around it and this whole idyllic setting with an island just opposite and so on. So again, he's giving a very specific view of what his voyage was like, this romantic idea of going to Greece. And actually, because he does include other drawings that are more strictly measured and so on, one can say that Leroy, in effect, set up a view of studying architecture that included a social component that was actually very important. So he, he did make some important contributions despite the criticisms that we could advance about his work otherwise. So now we come to Stuart and Rivette. And I show you first here the Hephaestion from the back because the first view that I want to show you by Stuart and Rivette is again a gouache that was made showing the building in perspective with Lycopitos rising up in the background there. And like Leroy, he shows some excavations in the foreground here, but the building itself is done uh, in a fairly accurate way. And on the printed page, it appears in various arrangements depending on what edition you look at. Because their book, The Antiquities of Athens, rarely have gone, uh, their books have rarely gone out of print. You can still buy it today for, I think, about $100 or so. You can buy a book that contains all three volumes with only preface by Frank S Salmon in it. And the one that's currently available is an excellent facsimile of the original 1762 edition. What you're looking at here is a later edition of the 19th century where they've taken two pages and squeeze them together. So you can find many, many versions of their books because they constantly were reprinted again and again and again. And their plan was to give you the overall view and then give you an actual ground plan of the building and then the details of the architecture. And I want to show you by way of an example their drawing for the Temple of Apollo on Delos where you can see they give you precise measurements all up and down uh, their reconstruction. And they are the ones who invented this. It may look very familiar to you because we still use this kind of scheme of taking out the center of the column in order to show you the entablature and the bottom all on one page. The Temple of Apollo at Delos was also unfinished. 
And this is one thing, here you see some of the columns here lined up in front of the podium. So they did actually venture outside of Athens. In fact, they even went up to Thessaloniki at one point to include some one famous building in their uh, book as well. One interesting thing, though, about Stuart and Rivette is that they didn't seem to take very much interest in the details of construction. And they didn't realize that those columns were unfluted because they were simply unfinished. And what happened is much later, when their books became popular, people used that nonetheless as a paradigm. And so there are uh, mansions and elegant buildings and churches, both in Ireland and England, that have unfluted columns. And it was because it was thought at the time of simply being an alternative style, not realizing at the time that really it's a mark of the, the, the temple or the original bu building being unfinished. Now, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how they actually did their work. Uh, we know that they used uh, folding bronze or brass, as it's usually referred to, ruler that allowed them to take measurements to the hundredth of an inch. And I show you here an actual example of one that dates to about 1740. So this is the kind that they might have taken. This is not the actual one that they took with them. Made by Thomas Heath who was an instrument maker of precision scientific instruments in London. And I also show you the type of, right, uh, of drawing and drafting kit of the sort that they might have used. And both of these images are of instruments that were in a special exhibit, exhibit last year at Oxford and Yale of precision drawing instruments of the 17th and 18th century. Very, very beautiful designs that are still preserved, but clearly show that they were actually used. So they're not just models, but this is the type of thing that they actually used. Now, uh, one of my favorite buildings that they worked on is the Temple on the Elysis River. In fact, the first article I ever published when I was a graduate student was on this lost temple. They drew it in their usual way. They have an overall view showing you the temple it was perched up on the bank opposite the, uh, the Temple of Olympian Zeus. And today, there is just barely visible some of its foundations, but it's almost the entire superstructure is lost. Some of the frieze has been identified and recovered, but mostly we have to study this temple through drawings. And uh, I just want to point out to you that it, it was tetra-style, amphipro-style, and so it was very similar to the Temple of Athena Niki, except that the cella building was much longer, as you can see here, in its form having been turned into a church where they knocked out the, the front columns here, they knocked a door into the back and built an apse out here and a cupola up above here. So this abandoned church then apparently was sold for scrap to be burnt in a lime kiln uh, sometime around 1780, so we can track the history of the whole building. And there are two stories that are given. One is that it was sold by the Turkish voivode to a Greek priest who then used it to build a bridge. The other one is that it was simply burnt up for lime. But there's an entire temple, uh, roughly contemporary, I think it was built around 430 or so, roughly contemporary with the Temple of Athena Niki, but now vanished. And we have it only because uh, Stuart and Rebecca recorded it, and also a few other travelers after them. And here you see their drawing of the facade. And one of the parts I want to bring to your attention is their, the elegant volumes of the Ionic Order and the careful way that they measured out all of this, again, to give a very, very specific and precise detailed uh, rendering of that. And I show you here a page from one of Je James Stewart's notebooks showing the notes that he took on the Erechthean capitals. And up in this view, you're looking at a special compass that was invented in 1760 just to draw volumes of the Ionic Order. 